Excellent. Okay. So um, I opted for, and uh, excuse me, I for some reason have what seems to be a really bad cold. It's not as bad as it sounds, but if I move too quickly, I start like not having much air, so I can be moving kind of slow. Uh, it's going around half of our department has it, so. Anyhow, I opted for online course evaluations. If you guys are willing to do them, or if you would do them, or if you want to do them, I, I posted it on the um, course announcement. Just click on that and go through and, and do them. Yeah, you got it to it. So this has been this has been up before, but just as a reminder, and it'll stay at the front of it's been at the front of the last two PowerPoints. The paper and film are due. Um, the paper's thirty percent. The film is how much? Is it ten percent? Yeah. yeah. I should add that. I was like, I forgot that. So it's due on April one to twenty-five. And the discussion forum cutoff is <coughs> sorry, Monday, April 15th, at just before midnight. And I'll grade those. And, and before you get your films in, I'll, I'll give you, as you probably know, your um, seminar presentation grades are up after, after you do them. If you can't find them, uh, let me know. Um, and I'll have, so what you have there right now, First term participation, uh, first and second term presentations, um, discussion form, first term, first term essay and film. So you got those five grades there. And the ones that are gonna come will be second term participation, second term discussion form, um, and then when you get them in, your essay and film. And if you have, like if it turns out you can't find them, or whatever, or if just uh, email me or text me, okay? I'm gonna be, I'll be around, because um, we're doing interviews and stuff. I'll be around April and May, so you, I need to be enough to get a hold of. So we're gonna do, yes, colors are killing me. Um, then maybe it doesn't, it looks bad, doesn't it? I don't even know why it's framed with a pink background, but to me that means the light's, the light's going. Because I can't imagine anybody putting it on pink, but we'll just deal. Um, so we're going to do the second lecture and class on Virilio. Um, just as a, just as a, a sort of reminder, I may be sitting down a bit during this one. Um, Virilio was... His dates are 1932 to 2018. Um, he's considered a dromologist. That's an analyst of accelerated phenomena. Um, he's a cultural theorist. He's a historian of war. And he's a philosopher of technology, aesthetics, and architecture. He's also a painter. He also worked in stained glass. So he's pretty, he was pretty diverse. And again, as a reminder, um, Speed of Politics, which we're doing the second half of today, it was published in 1977, the English edition, 86, and the edition you're looking at is 2006. And so we'll get started. So if we pick up where we left off last week, Virilio is considered a analyst of speed, a dromologist, who does philosophy of speed and from the positionality of speed. So as a reminder, the concept of dromology is the science of speed. Dromos is the Latin term for race. A dromologist means the analyst of accelerated phenomena. And what he studies is how innovations in speed influence the economy, 
the social and the political. Well, we don't need to go through this, but, but he looks at the intense life of the here and now. And that's a slide from, from last week. So Romeo is all about <coughs> speed and interruption and the accident. He writes what's been termed speed philosophy. <coughs> Sorry. And he does so from sites that are different from other philosophers and cultural theorists. That is, he does continental philosophy from the sites of war or military history, architecture, photography, technology. And he really considers himself, or considered himself, he died in 2018, as a philosopher of the instant present. Now, This is also a repeat slide, but I think it's important that both the object of Virilio's study and his style are speed. So both the object and his style are speed. That is, content and form are one. And he says we're taken in by speed, we're seduced by speed. And what is speed but transfer of energy? But it gets faster and faster as civilization progresses, according to Virilio. He holds that the speeding up of technologies, especially communication technologies, and by that, because he's writing this in 1977, and he wrote up until about 2010, probably later. Um, so when he's talking about communication technologies, he's talking about the net, email, and he says what's happened with the net and email, and then you could add all sorts of other apps in there like Facebook, Instagram, anything you want to add, is that they've really speeded up time. They were all in one sort of time. They've abolished time and distance. So we're all on, we're all on what you could call net time. At least part of us are. So for example, you can be sitting in class in like, it's about, I don't know, quarter to 12. And if you're on Facebook, you can be communicating with people that are in various locations on a 24 hour clock. So we're always split between the local time and the global time. And one of the things that Virilio says is that time and distance has gotten, it's kind of disappeared. Now for Virilio, speed and technology have, have basically a military gestation. On page 90 for this week's reading, he says that history progresses at the speed of its weapon systems. And so if you take a look at these weapons, it's quite amazing actually. I mean, I don't necessarily know what they mean other than they're really fast. So if you take a look at the Tomahawk cruise missile, uh, a Mac 8, it's 609 miles per hour. The supersonic Mac 1 to 5 is 915 to 3,806 miles per hour. And the hypersonic, which is five, Mac 5 to 10, is 38,006 to 7,612 miles per hour. Um, Chabrillo really sees that, that history, and particularly the military, progresses at the speed of the weapons it produces. So he's from the start looking at, we talked about this a bit last week, but he's looking at a military capitalist social formation. You could call it sort of the military industrial complex if you're Marcuse. Um, if you're Virilio, you would call it like military capitalist. Hey, Andre. So those, those are speeds. Now, of course, our bodies can't keep up with speeds like that. You know, and if you listen to astronauts talk, either one of the first, was, is it Buzz Aldrin, was doing, um, he got this, after he was the first person or second person walking on the moon, he was at a lot of different art space conferences where he was making these images and he was sprinkling 
which again was kind of odd that way. He was, it might have been, there was two of them. Um, I can't remember which astronaut it was, but he was sprinkling moon dust on like paintings and selling them as like moon art, um, which is kind of cool. He seemed like a cool guy. More, but when he talked about, of course, all, the question always is like about the metabolic body, which is your flesh and blood body, in, enclosed in a capsule that is going this fast. So the technological speed and the metabolic speed. And, and Virilio says that our metabolic speed can never keep up to the technological speed. So history progresses at the speed of its weapon systems, according to Virilio. That is, war serves as a motor of history. That cities, cathedrals, the economy, politics, Virilio sees these all as being products of military mobilization and deployment. Now he says the way in which mass communication is speeded up, and he's got a book called this, but the way in which mass communication is speeded up means that industrial war has given away to what he calls the information bomb. So the next great collapse, and he's got a book called The Information Bomb, which is kind of cool. I think it was written in 2005. The next great collapse, according to Virilio, is going to be an information collapse. So by that, you've probably seen that happen. You see that happen in collapses of stock market. You see a technological collapse there um, where, it, where it is. effects are, are local, but they just spread globally really fast and it becomes what he calls an integral accident. Um, that, that he considers a techno-informational uh, collapse. The other collapse that he's been predicting particularly when it changed to 2000, so 1999, I don't know where you guys were in 1999 changing New Year's Eve, um, changing to year 2000, but the prediction there <coughs> was that the, the internet system could go down because of the change in numbers. So you were, so everybody was like, you know, watching to see what was gonna happen, nothing happened. Of course, but everybody was prepared for this accident that didn't occur. And that would be an information bomb, according to Virilio. He talks about globalization as the speed of light. He says, and I need a cough again. <coughs> Sorry. He says that the speed of light does not merely transform the world. Rather, it becomes the world. But what's happened in terms of globalization, with the speed in which all parts of the globe can be contacted, it's at the speed of light, and faster in a sense. Because you've got, um, you've, you've actually got technological connections, wires underground, tubes underground that can go as fast as the speed of light. And I think it might even be able to go faster. I could be wrong on that, but there, there, so that's what he's meaning. He's saying globalization is happening at the speed of light because of the tech connectivity. So if you see the new movie on um, the one second advantage in the stock market, which came out a couple of weeks ago, what they're doing is building a tube underground to get one second advantage and make tons of money. And they're building it like across, across the US. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's really worth seeing in terms of seeing, seeing like it's, it's based on a true events, right? So globalization is the speed of light. It can't take shape without the speed of light. Now, for Virilio, as we said last week, and he says it again, he also writes somewhat circularly, circularly so he will repeat it. He says, speed doesn't mean there's no deceleration or slowness or inertia. And he comes up with this term, polar inertia, which we talked about last week. And that's when, on the one hand, you're sitting in front of a computer and your ideas are going across the wor world at the speed of light and you're staying in one place. Or you're sitting on a plane or a high-speed train, stationary, and you're, sh you're hurling through space. Now, as a sort of reminder from last week, and I want to pick up a bit from here, 
What Virilio suggests, at their, when he talks about revolution, he says there's two strategies of revolution that produce two different proletariats. One is the military proletariat, and he refers to the military proletariat towards the end of the first part you read as a nation on the march. The second proletariat is the industrial proletariat. The distinction between the nation on the march as a military proletariat and the industrial proletariat is that the latter, the industrial proletariat, is enclosed in a national territory, what Virilio calls the vast camp of the national territory. And then you might say, OK, so what about migrant labor? Like, what is migrant labor? Because migrant labor, in a sense, is is some sort of combination of labor on a march and labor contained within a national territory. And Virilio has, I believe, written about migrant labor. Um, so what, what he would say is it's basically a combination of the idea of the ex-military proletariat now as a reserve army of labor that's on the march looking for work in national territories as um, and often subsistent work as migrant labor, and sending, sending the wages home. So if you take a look, there was something on, like I don't even know what, what it was on, um, but I'm sure it's on YouTube. So if you take a look at North Korean labor in Russia, um, it's really interesting because people, the North Korean people that are working in Russia are basically working like 20 hour days, they're working they're seen as being heroes of the state, so their first wage is going to the state to help build military. The second wage is for them and their families. So they're working, and they're working construction. So for anybody in the room, I haven't, but if anybody in the room's worked construction, um, which I'm sure some people have. No? You have, okay. So good, <laughs> I was gonna say. So imagine working 20 hours of construction in a day, day after day, right? Like that's like killing, um, and it's dangerous. And they're working with big machines and everything. So, in that sense, um, that what you've got there is some sort of combination of a mobile workforce, extreme exploitation in a way, the state in uh, in the national territory taking you know half half the wages from this to build state military. Um, and so, just I would just Google to take a look at this, because it's actually quite interesting. And, and you know, um, I would just Google uh, North Korean workers in Russia, construction workers, and take a look at it. And you can also see there the distinction between the fast and slow classes, maybe. Now, what Virilio says is, what you see happening is an increase in the state, what he calls the state military pro proletarianization. And on page 54, and this is from last week, but I'm gonna move, this part's from last week. He suggests that the Marxist state appears as first as a dictatorship of motor functions. And I thought that was interesting in terms of the North Korean and, and Russian construction example. Because what you've got is a dictatorship of motor functions. The state, in a way, is controlling your motor functions in terms of labor. He, he says, calls it on 54, a totalitarianized, totalitarianism very carefully programming and exploiting every form of mass movement. So it's a dictatorship of motor functions. <coughs> In this case, work motor functions, or mobility about where you can go in the foreign country you're working in, and a totalitarianism that, that programs and exploits every form of mass movement. The chapter starting the news section, uh, chapter one in uh, part three, in part three, Drovologicals. Society 
Here he talks about unable bodies, and he says, okay, what happens, like what do you do with the damage that's done to bodies by war machines? And he said, well, they're technologically compensated. They're compensated for by prosthesis. Which then allows him to go again to progress. And he says that dromological process progress and process, but progress, that you also see in the compensation by prosthesis is violence and violence of movement. For Virilio, his understanding of violence, and I believe I said this last week, his understanding of violence is different from Sorel's understanding of violence, um, from Fanon's, for example. He sees it as nothing but movement. A revolution is bodies on the move. Bodies engaged in, engaged in movement. Bodies occupying social space. Bodies, to go back to Ingalls, taking over the boulevard. So if you're doing your second paper on violence, make sure to include probably Virilio's concept of violence. He talks about Marinetti, and I don't know if you know um, the futurism, futurist art. Futurist art, there's, a, there's kind of a, a problem in that, I mean, futurism was absolutely seduced by speed, okay? They were the artists of speed. The Guggenheim had a futurist exhibition about three, three years ago, um, which was quite amazing. And, and, and really spectacular visually, and really able to catch, you know, it's 1909 to 1920 and 30, really able to catch the motion of speed in the art. Um, the problem with futurism is as it develops, Marinetti particularly gets associated with Italian fascism. And they end up hooking, hooking fascism to sort of the speed argument. Um, Virilio doesn't. But I mean, I think you should be aware of that with Marinetti. That's not to say that the art isn't awesome, but it's also to say that it took, it's not to say it's the only trajectory that it should take, but it's a trajectory that it ended up taking. So what Marinetti suggests is that the armored car reduces what Nietzsche calls the overman, which you'll remember from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, to simply an inhuman type driving that is the animal body disappears in the metallic body of the machine, which is able to annihilate time and space. That the, the animal body, this is around page 84, um, disappears in the metallic body, which does away with time and space. So I mean, for people that like to drive fast, you know, and I, I can't really say I like to drive fast, but hey, for people that have driven on Autobahn in Germany, you've got to drive really fast just to keep up, right? So that's really interesting because you really get a sense. So, you know, I mean, since there's no speed limit, even in like a relatively slow car, you're doing about 140, 150. Um, and people in fast cars, you know, are just going by you, right? So, you know, if you're in the slow lane, you're probably doing about 140, 150, which is what I was doing. Um, the people in the fast life are just like going like crazy, and you really get a sense. Um, we were playing craft work, um, the song on the Audubon, right? Um, so just because it, it really, you really get a sense of why they wrote it, because it matches the speed of the Audubon. But um, you, you get a sense of what Marinetti's talking about. That is that you do become this, this physical body, this metabolic body, enclosed inside of a steel capsule. Car. Um, and you can feel the speed. And then you all of a sudden you're doing polar inertia because you're really not moving. And you're hurling through space. So Marinetti wrote this manifesto. And I didn't take all the points out of it, but I took a couple I thought you might be interested in. Um, you, he says, we say the world's magnificence has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing car whose hood, imagine, whose 
is adorned with great pipes like serpents or, or explosive breaths. A roaring car that seems to ride on grape shot is more beautiful than this statue, the victory of Sam, Samothrace. And then he says, we stand on, on the last promontory of the centuries. This is 1909. So, you know, you can imagine the cars are going about 35 miles per hour. And, they're, and maybe they get up to 50, but I think they're about 35, 40. And it's really, and, and, and Marinetti is writing this. So you can imagine how in awe he would be going 140 or 50. Um, so he says, we stand on the last promontory of the centuries. Why should we look back? What we want is to break down the mysterious doors of the impossible. Time and space died yesterday. We already live in the absolute because we've created the eternal omnipresent speed. Um, and so what, what now Virilio would provide a critique of how futurism got, got combined, some of the futurists got combined with fascism and got seduced by the sort of speed of the state. Because I mean speed, you have to, in a way, critique what type of speed, like who's using the speed? Or is speed, or is speed using others? And that's not fit particularly well. Um, and you can see the change of this, this statue where they've got wings on it. So the art, you know, the art is pretty incredible. The ideology that comes out of it isn't. Um, and what you've got is an early on understanding of the presence of speed, the omnipresence of speed, when in fact it would blow their minds how fast we were going today. Now, if you go to chapter two, part three, because he does it in parts, um, this is called the boarding of metabolic vehicles. And he goes back to where he talks about dromological, dromological progress. And he goes back and he says that it not only produces two types of bodies, okay, those of hope and despair, but it also produces two types of souls. And he's probably using that metaphorically. And he's also picking up on Nietzsche's will to power here, as he understands it. Um, and he says these two types of souls, one is weak and vulnerable because it's dependent on its environment. The other is powerful because it's put its will out of reach thanks to its deterritorialization. It can be anywhere. Thanks to the sophistication of its economy, it's controlling the capitalist economy, and thanks to its viewpoint, which would be, if you were using Ernest Mandel, late capitalism, advanced capitalism if you're using somebody else, um, you know, liberal capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, those would all be the ideological viewpoint. So there's two types of souls, one weak and vulnerable because it's dependent on the local environment and what's in, in, where it's enclosed, the other powerful because it's put its will out of reach thanks to its deterritorialization. I mean, we know capital can, is, is transnational, um, multinational, deterritorialized. Um, that the economy is, is an international global economy. And the viewpoint, of course, is the viewpoint of accumulation. <coughs> Uh, it's the viewpoint of capital accumulation. And of course, remember from last week that for Virilio, stasis, not being able to keep up, is a form of death. And that those who move quickly control capital and possess the earth. The former, those those, the first type of soul that is the soul of, that is weak and vulnerable because it's dependent on its environment, um, are deprived of place and identity. That is, in a sense, they're like the military proletariat. He sees them as unfortunately being bodies without will and having to follow the 
the movement of capital. He also says, he goes then into a discursion into military, and he says, until the end of the 19th century, and, and I know there's some research I did on the UK, until the end of the 19th century, the barracks were kind of a kind of clinic, this is on page 102, where venereal disease and typhus cause more deaths among soldiers than war. They were, and the reason it caused more death among the soldiers than war was twofold, right? Um, they were in a contained, controlled space, so it spread. And when they actually started testing uh, population for venereal disease or for typhus, they tested the women on the street. They didn't test the men. So they kept spreading it. Um, so in my first book on prostitution, I took a look at that in terms of the state policy that they, that the, they were targeting uh, the women working. And of course, they could test anybody um, who was told, said to be a prostitute. So they tested a lot of working class women who got targeted as, as working um, as a prostitute. So Virilio critiques liberal reason and rationalism. He's critiquing the liberal reason and rationalism of the Enlightenment. And he says, look, reason as we know, starting with Kant and the way we've talked about it, is a politically invested concept. When you say, I mean, if you go back to, you know, Locke, Hobbes, when you say a certain group have reason, that's a politically invested concept. And when you say a certain group doesn't have reason, that's also, it's just the, the underside of the first one, and that's very much a politically invested concept. And of course, we know that only those who have reason can vote. Only those who have reason can be citizens. And then you get a playing out in history of those who are considered to be reasonable. Um, you know, so initially women, children, um, initially non-property owners, then women, children were considered not to be reasonable. It goes, it goes through um, the excluded populations. So what really I'll say very quickly, of course, is that liberal reason and rationalism and the Enlightenment is a politically invested concept. Those that are considered reasonable have certain rights. Those who are considered not to have reason don't have the rights, usually the rights of citizenship. Now, to go back to the very beginning in Ranciere and the ignorant schoolmaster, Virilian says that what gets targeted is the so-called absence of reason. It gets targeted and it's located in what's considered the bodies of the ignorant, where, where rights are taken away or rights are not given. He also kind of slams Marxism on this, and particularly the dictatorship of the proletariat. He says this relationship is reproduced in the Marxist organizational chart. The organizational chart of, you know, the um, London proletariat to go to Fanon. I mean, it's Marxist term, but Fanon really shows how it's applied. Then there's a the proletariat, and then there's a dictatorship of the proletariat. What Fanon showed is that this, this um, sort of enlightenment organization of reason gets blown away in post-colonial revolutions with the role of the lumpen proletariat. Now, Aurelio on page 108 talks about the soul and reason. And he says, the soul neither pre-exists or survives the disappearance of the body vehicle, a flesh and blood body, a metabolic body, or the machine. So the soul neither pre-exists nor survives the disappearance of the body vehicle or machine, but as potential reason, and especially scientific reason, it can act on foreign bodies which are distinct and distant in time and space. He's talking about colonialism there. That, that really our soul is not going to survive the disappearance of our body vehicle, but as reason, as collective reason, as so-called scientific reason, it ends up acting on foreign bodies which are distant in time and space. This is on page 108. He says that animal, territorial, vegetable bodies, bodies without will, bodies not yet born, become technical bodies or technological objects. That animal, territorial, vegetable bodies, bodies without will, uh, those, the classes of despair, bodies not yet born, but born in a certain time and space, 
become technical bodies or technological objects. And he says, here's the true social domination, which of God is the bestiary, bestiary of engines, the bestiary of technology which allows one group of countries to dominate other countries. So you could pull this, what he's saying here, both into a colonial critique and into an international uh, critique of globalization. And that was, I think, his intent in writing this. Because it really was never fully obvious, right? Now, if you take a look at page 110, I want to do something with that before we go on. Um, first of all, I'll just remind you how he says he works in his books. He says, I work, and this is from a book that's called Pure War. Um, and he says, which is a great book, um, it's a small one. He says, most of really his books are small. Uh, Speed and Politics is one of the bigger ones. He says, I work in staircase. <coughs> I begin the sentence. <coughs> Sorry. I work out an idea. <coughs> I consider it suggestive enough. I jump a step to another idea without bothering with the development. The developments are the episodes. I try to reach the tendency. Tendency is a chain of level, change of level. So how he does this, if you take a look at page 110, I thought it was a good example. You could almost pick any page, but 110 works. And he also says he doesn't believe in explanations. He says he believes in suggestion. But the obvious quality is implicit. He notes the importance of interruption of things, that things stop, that this is productive when they stop. The fact of stopping and saying, let's go somewhere else is very important. So if you go to page 110, if you've got it here, what he says is, now it's just, it sounds, it, it's a really good example of how he's doing here. talking about ignorant bodies, the technological revelation of, of controlling ignorant bodies. He says, this is a logical next step from the gymnasium. Then he goes from the gymnasium to a mixture of highway and sex. He was probably watching Cronenberg's uh, crash at that point. But the way he's mixing the highway and sex, he says, in both bodies are thrown together by chance meetings and sexual collisions soon forgotten, autos, motorcycles stolen, um, raped, and abandoned. Then he moves on to good conduct. And he says, good conduct isn't anymore taught in public school, but through driver's education, which is becoming an obligatory part of the curriculum. So was driver's, did you have to take driver's education in high school? Or was that like a, 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 a elective? Elective. Elective, OK. Um, and he says, but this isn't the advance. But, so he goes to driver's education saying, that's where people learn morals. But isn't this already the adventure of military monicism, transforming the mystical body of Christ into an armed body into marching orders? And then he takes a look at the fighting monks, that is, monks that become soldiers, the soldier monk, on that third paragraph there. And he says that the institution of monastic autism in the very nature, time, space, and social and human organization that he re relinquishes, his renunciation of personal tastes and identity prefigure the nihilism of the technological revolution spoken of by Heidegger. The monk, <coughs> I'm sorry, voluntarily absent from himself, sworn to silence, chastity, and especially obedience, becomes the vehicle of his director of consciousness, the drive shaft that powers order a superior and universal reason. So what you've got here is he goes from a quick aside on the change in bodies and sex to good conduct as morals taught at driver education to military mon monasticism, monasticism. And then he discusses the military monk. And he says the military monk is a model and precursor 
of every citizen as war machine. And you're thinking, okay, I guess. Um, he brings in Hegel's modern state. He says it's no coincidence that it was born in Prussia. And he, he links Prussia with the, the military monk, the warrior. If you read on page 11, 111. And by the end of the paragraph that we just read, he links the monk with universal reason as its drive shaft. Now the warrior on page 111 claims a function that Virilio says is a perversion <coughs> of the priests. It's a perversion of the priests. And it's for the, he says, for the Judeo-Christian, the warrior is a prevented priest, perverted priest. But the armed force is always one of military occupation. And here the warrior reappears as a perverted priest, and the priest reappears as a perverted warrior. When he talks about perverted priests on page 113, he identifies them, he says, Muslim, Christian, or otherwise. They develop an arsenal of war alongside an inferno mixing poverty. So if you've ever stayed in a monastery, which I have in Portugal, um, you'll see that it's very simple. Mixing poverty with, rather love of, than love of the world, hatred of the world, when it's a military moment. Now, he links the military invader's performative action with that of athletes. This is page 114. Specifically, Olympic champions. So the first record, he says, progressed by hours, then minutes, then seconds, then fractions of seconds, until the point now that they can only be noted electronically, because it's a fraction of a second. He suggests that one day, the champion's going to disappear in the limits of his own record. And if you go to, see, he ends this chapter on page 114 with the first car, the first motorized vehicle, 1771. The first motorized vehicle is Joseph Cunot's 9, uh, 1771 military trolley. It's steam, <coughs> steam powered, and it's if you've traveled on steam-powered engines, you see the limit, he's saying, this is the limit of the passage from the metabolic vehicle to the technological vehicle. I don't know if you've ever been on steam-powered trains. Um, years ago, um, I was fortunate enough to be on an old train going through Portugal. It was about 1975, maybe. And what was interesting is it's a completely different experience because you've still got sort of the metabolic a vehicle, you've got your metabolic body. You, 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 whereas if you're going on a high speed train or faster trains, in that sense you enter polar inertia. So he's saying that the steam powered trolley, which then becomes the train, um, or was actually developed on a train, developed in conjunction with the steam of, of trains, um, the limit of the passage from the metabolic vehicle to the technological vehicle that's the sort of end of it, spilling its smoke like a last breath, a final symbolic manifestation of the motor power of living bodies. And there's a number of pictures of this online. This is in a museum. So the chapter ends with this very first motorized vehicle, steam-powered military trolley, which marked the beginning of the passage and the limit from the metabolic vehicle, that is the human body, to the technological vehicle. This was the first step. Then this leads really on ch in uh, chapter three, part three, to the end of the proletariat. But he says that dromological and human and social progress coincide, but they don't converge. He gives you on page 115 a five-step trajectory of the proletariat. So if you go to page 115, he says, okay, the end of the proletariat. Now, 
The development, he says, he says, evidently, dromological progress and what we conventionally call human and social progress coincided, but did not converge. <coughs> and he looks at the development. He says, you know, a society without technological vehicles. And then he says something really sexist and weird, in which the woman plays the role of a logistical spouse, mother of Warren of the truck. And you're thinking, all right. And he never explains why he's saying that. You can find other references in various places. And then he looks at the indiscriminate boarding of soulless bodies as metabolic vehicles. Then you get the empire of speed and technological vehicles. Then you get the metabolic vehicle competing with and then defeated by the earthly technological vehicle, where the proletariat's ending. And he says, we could logically conclude with the last paragraph, the end of the dictatorship of the proletariat and of history in the war of time. So he's saying these things happen, which then get to the end of the proletariat and of the history in the war of time. Now, I mean, the sequence, you, you could probably say, OK, that's a weird sequence. But in terms of his theory, that's the sequence he's coming up with. And he's got sort of a military history mixed with a critique of Marxism there. And he also, you'll see, is Christianity sort of playing um, in terms of Christianity, it, it's a liberation theology, uh, much in the um, tradition of Henri Dussel. Henri Dussel, if you don't know who he is, is a very interesting um, Latin American liberation theologist that brings together Marxism and, and um, the idea of liberation theology, working with the poor, and, and, having, and, and also the poor changing their own circumstances through having things provided they can do that. Um, so Virilio doesn't go into any details there, but that really is kind of what he's referring to, or at least what I think he's referring to. And what he links it with when he gets to the end, they get to the defeat of the metabolic vehicle by the earthly technological vehicle. Then he goes into 1968 in France, and he says French radicals and socialists pursue socialism with the human face, which is what he would pursue, not, so he's talking about the student movement there, the workers' movement, um, that it's what he, how he would pursue it, not as a dictatorship of the proletariat. So he's consistently critiquing there Marx's concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat. But he's not setting out and saying, I'm gonna do a critique of the dictatorship of the proletariat. He slips it in his theory. Then he makes this very interesting claim. On page 136, he says, Revolution goes faster than people. So you've got a digital revolution in the blue. You've got inserted there French Revolution. <coughs> you've got education revolution here where people are throwing pens. And what you've got there is, is climate justice. And he says that revolution goes faster than people. And you kind of wonder, how is that possible? So if you go to page 136, I just want to sort of talk about that for a second, and then I want to go back to something else he says. That partly that revolution goes faster than the people is a quote from, from uh, General Costas Gomez at the beginning of the, the events in Portugal. Um, and what Virilio suggests is that revolutions in the West have never been made by people, but by military institutions. And he's right and wrong. He says that what happens is that the, what he calls the 117, the animal body of the worker is devalued as the bodies of other domestic species were before him. That our metabolic body, our animal body, is very similar to other domestic species. That the proletarian worker is declared unusable, and, when it com and what comes to dominate is the proletarian military again. So he's looking at Portugal in 1975, and he's looking at um, Chile, after Alenye is ousted from power and Pinochet comes in. So in 1975, 
in Portugal, um, you have this sort of fascist dictatorship of Salazar. It's ended. <coughs> and I was in Portugal, I think it was like January 1976. So what you've got there is this real hope for a change in society. Now, I mean, Portugal now is democratic, a liberal democratic society. What you had happening there was pretty interesting because you had all different splinter groups riding around advertising their rallies on motorcycles. You know, so they'd be like socialist this rally, communist this rally. It was really kind of interesting. Um, and you had this real hope for change. What ended up happening at that time, and Virilio writes about it, because remember, he wrote this in 1977. And Virilio writes about it in 77. He said, what happened is Salazar, Salazar's room regime ends, and the leftist forces for a period of time dominate. What you get then is the armed forces integrate with the leftist forces, and you get this sort of left proletarian military that then becomes more just a proletarian military until eventually um, democracy comes. If you take a look at Pinochet, <coughs> at Pinochet's regime, so Allende, of course, was a socialist politician in Chile. He gets ousted by the generals. Pinochet comes in, and he controls the country with what Virilio identifies as a proletarian army. That is an army of workers who are militarized. And I mean, with Pinochet, um, Unless you supported Pinochet, in many cases, you were killed. So last couple of years ago, I was on a, um, a witness on a performance action going to the Atacama Desert in Chile, returning. Um, one of the things that Pinochet's regime did was dissenters were basically dropped from planes into the desert. Like, so many people disappeared. It was one of the most brutal regimes in modern history. Um, and I was part of witnessing a, mem a, a sort of memorial performance of returning an artist made ceramic bones and there was like, like an endurance performance of three hours of, of returning them, there were five performance artists, to the, to the desert in memory of the people that had disappeared that had never been found. And you, there's groups still searching for like bones in the desert um, to get DNA to see if their family member or loved one had been disappeared that way. So, so really all is seeing this in 1977. Um, and he's saying that what happened with, with Pinochet is that the army ends up being part of, it, it's composed of the proletariat. It's a proletarian military. And we talked about what this means in terms of revolution going faster than the people. For Virilio, what it means on page 136 is that the, the revolution is, is sort of led by military institutions and is led by technology. But the examples up here, you know, the, the demand on climate change, um, the demand in terms of education, the um, commune in the French Revolution, um, or after the French Revolution, and the digital revolution maybe, but I'm not sure that these revolutions are going faster than the people. I would say the people are, I, I think it's at a different stage, perhaps. The people are controlling their demands on the state. So that it's not, it's, it's metabolic body control of demands on the state, often disseminated through technological means. So often disseminated in, in the bottom two through technological means of connection. Um, so you've got both local and global on the dissemination. So if you've got demands for educational improvement in the US or in Canada or in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, these are all connected in terms of a digital revolution. Or for climate justice. Climate justice is an international global revolution that's hooked also with youth, which is kind of interesting. And although, the metabolic bodies are on the street. Their connectivity is done um, through technological means, the sort of digital revolution. 
On part four, when you get to part four, the state of emergency, he says the territory now, and what we've seen though is a resurgence of nationalism, but he says territory has lost significance in terms of the projectile. What exists is this non-place of speed, the non, sort of the digital non-place of speed. But you can engage in instantaneous action at a distance. That is from a distance, as we know, in terms of drone warfare. Um, what you get is immediate penetration and environmental and human destruction done by people that are sitting in, you know, um, an industrial complex in the US. So there's a non-place of speed, that you get an instantaneous action at a distance. You're, so one, one of the things that he writes about later is people operating the drones are sitting in polar inertia, um, targeting you know, territories that are very far away and killing civilians as collateral damage. And if you, if you see any of the footage, of, which I'm sure you have, of them operating, um, and I mean, there's also been, there's been documentaries, but also um, movies. You get this immediate penetration and destruction of humans and environment. So when Virilio's writing this in, in 1977, he's saying, look, geographical spaces are shrinking. That you can have warfare at a distance. You can have this because speed and technology has increased. He suggests that we have a worldwide phenomenon of the direct encounter of every surface on the globe. And we do. There's an, a direct encounter. We could go online right now and engage in the direct encounter of every surface on the globe with other people that are engaging it. What's gone is the ancient intercity duel, a fight between two cities. What's also gone is war between nations really, the conflict between naval empires and continental powers have sort of progressed or digressed to what he calls the juxtaposition of every locality. Now he's writing these essays in the 70s, published in 1977. What ha was happening then was the arming of the, the race toward the end of the world as distance. So if you, you know, if you look up Star Wars, or the treaties, the, the gap treaties, that what you're doing is, is uh, Soviet Union um, and the US are signing these treaties while developing the, the arms race um, in terms of distance. So Virilio observes that without the violence of speed, weapons, of course, would not be so fearsome. Without the violence of speed, um, which in which technology develops that, or what Heidegger would call the inframing tendency of technology, that these, these would not be so violent, that these would not be so pervasive, that these would not cover the whole globe. That they would not be so fearsome. He says that if you disarm, to disarm would mean to decelerate. And then he suggests, that, these are different time zones, the numbers. He says that in World War II, the nuclear explosion on Hiroshima completed what he calls the cycle of spatial wars. What we have at the end of the 20th century and the 20th, beginning of the 21st century is the war of time. So this is on page 154 to 55. The nuclear explosion, explosive completed the cycle of spatial wars at the end of this century. The implosive, beyond politically and economically invading, invaded territories, um, inaugurates the war of time. And if you go to page 155, there's something I'd like to read from page 155. So we're in a state of emergency, page 155. He says, let's go back to 1962 and the crucial events of the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
So you've got the Soviet Union and the US, and you've got Cuba. At that time, <coughs> the two superpowers had 15 minutes warning time for war. The install, so that was from the Soviet Union to Russia. The installation of Russian rockets on Castro's Cuba threatened to reduce the Americans' warning to 30 seconds, which was unacceptable for Kennedy, President Kennedy, whatever the risks of his categorical refusal. We all know what happened, the installation of a direct line, the hotline, and the interconnection of the two heads of state. Then you go to 10 years later in 72. Um, the normal warning time goes down to several minutes, 10 for ballistic, a mere two for satellite, and you've got Nixon and Brezhnev signing the first strategic arms limitation agreement. And if you go down a little bit further, he says, in fact, this agreement aims less at the quantitative limitation of weapons than at the preservation of a properly human political power, since the constant progress of rapidity threatens from one day to the next to reduce the warning time for the nuclear war, or for nuclear war, to less than one fatal minute. Thus abolishing, and this is what he's worried about, that you've got one, you've got a warning time of one minute. Thus abolishing the head of state's power of reflection and decision in favor of a simple and pure automation of defense systems. But then when the, the nuclear warning time gets less and less, you've got less time to think about it. And I don't know what it is now. It's probably at one minute. But they probably negotiate a lot beforehand. Um, so that so really is very much concerned there about the reduction in time, not the capability of the, of the technological um, war machinery, but the reduction in time of, of warning. That with one, mi one minute to determine whether nuclear war is going to happen, you don't have enough time for thought. There's no time for what you know, Heidegger would call critical reflection. And there's no time for what Brilliot would call, not Brilliot, Marcuse would call, you know, critical theory, critical thought. So speed is war. And Brilliot says speed is war, the last war. That what's occurred is the transition from the state of siege of wars as space, where you're under siege and space is being occupied, to the state of emergency, the war of time. He says, war has moved on page 163 from the action stage to the co conception stage that, as we know, characterizes automation. That, that war is not now based on action as much as on conception, which is going to characterize the automation of war without the critical reflection and critical thought taking place. Now, as you recall, from last week's lecture, we talked about the accident. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because he picks it up again. And I want to see how much time we've got. Yeah, it'll probably be about another eight minutes. Um, so from last week, this is a famous quote from Virilio. It will no longer be war if it's the continuation of politics by other means. It will be what he's called the integral accident. It is a continuation of politics by other means. Now, integral, I want to talk a bit about the integral accident. Because um, I, I went to another text of his, and I think he sets it out better there. Um, the inte integral accidents are speed accidents. They trigger other accidents. So I used this slide last week, and it's just a reminder where he says every accident um, produces a corresponding accident. The invention or adoption of a new technology is, also, is always also the invention or adoption of a new accident. And if you go to um, Nietzsche, and what we read of, of Nietzsche in terms of that book there, Thurston, on page 139 there, and the one you the um, translation you read, what Nietzsche says is man is the redeemer of accidents. 
And one of the grad or one of the fourth year students in uh, cyber politics, when I was talking, because I was saying, okay, we're doing really on third year, um, and I was saying that every technology, you know, as theories, every technology produces a corresponding accident, that any new, any invention or adoption of a new technology is always also a new accident. And what Alex said, she said, Yes, and every new accident allows you then to produce a new technology. So you've got this circular thing going on. I thought that's really, that's really true. And it really fits in with what Nietzsche says about humans being the redeemer of accidents. So you fix that, and then you produce a new technology that's going to produce a new accident. You've got a cyclical thing going on there. Um, so the original accident of a new device there's, there's three there. One is the Hindenburg disaster, 1937. Some people say it's 36, but I, but I think it's 37. The Space Shuttle Challenger, 86, and the Chernobyl accident, which happened in 1986, um, that is Chernobyl 30 years later, in 2016, um, yeah. So if you take a look online at Chernobyl, you can see <coughs> Images of the accident, and, and artists have gone in and, and photographers and shot it every year. I mean, it's an, and I think there's even been something held there, because uh, I think it's supposedly not toxic now. So, Brilliant says, and this is from the show he curated on accidents in France, those images of accidents. Um, he says that technologies are always in advance of the mentality of the users. That as users, we need several years to familiarize ourselves with the new technology. Technologies are also just as far ahead of the mentality of makers, those engineers who strain their ingenuity to invent devices, to the point where the knowledge of major risks is not fully known. So I thought, well, these are three examples of that. Excuse me, the other example, most recently, is the 737, uh, eight and nine, uh, 7 and 8, I think. So the people that, the, tech, the engineers who developed it, were not aware of, well, actually it was also the cheapness of um, airlines not buying the device that allows pilots to over, over um, ride the, when, when you take off on a, the, these particular types of 737s, there's a pull down. And if you don't allow the pilot to have override on it, you can end up being pulled, pulled down. Because um, it, it re-pulls you down after, the nose goes down after 10 seconds even when the pilot pulls it up, unless you override it. The pilots, from what I can understand from the news media, um, were not told about this, and only certain airlines actually purchased the override. They also weren't trained in terms of the training manual. Then I was thinking, that's interesting, because when you buy a new car now, you used to get this big manual, now you get a little manual because we can't read so much. And then you can find the big manual online, but often they don't have the most up-to-date manual. Um, mind you, depending on the car, they don't change that much between 2017, perhaps, and 2019, but some do. So in that sense, people are out driving around in technology they don't know how to use, you know, which is really true. Or if you grab a car rental, they want to get you off the lot as fast as they can. So you've got this car, and you figure out where the gas is, like where, where to put gas in. You figure out a couple of other things. And then you're like, well, damn, I don't know these other things, and somebody's stolen the manual. Um, so I mean, you can usually, cars are, the cars that, you know, the low-end cars that you get at rentals are not necessarily that complicated. But I would actually say, you know, having just got a new car, um, you really do need to look at the manual, okay? And you also need to figure out where stuff is in that particular vehicle because it's not all the same, unless you bought a vehicle that's just an update of the previous one. And, and we're basically driving around without fully knowing what the machine can do, um, what it's capable of. And also, you know, what its, you know, what its um, strengths are. So if you've ever been in a Fiat Spider, I got one in a rental, which I had to take back because I couldn't get the luggage in the back. It was like, the, and I only travel with a carry-on, so is my, my friend. And so we got this Fiat Spider, which is like an awesome-looking sports car, and it's like really cool. 
Um, the only problem was we couldn't get our luggage in the back. And the two other guys got it, and one of them was an ammunition packer. He's like, I can do that. So he got the luggage in. We're like, great. This will be. So we, and then we take off on it, and without practice driving it and understanding its features, it, it was really hard to like be competent. Um, so I took it back and got one that was like easier. Uh, however, if you trained on it, and if you were used to driving sports cars, probably would have been fine. So people are out there using technology. Oh, also my friend couldn't get in and out. It was so low. He was like, I can't get out of the car because he's a little bit old. Um, and so you're like, okay, this is not, yeah, this is not going well. But but in terms of this, I think really I was really got. Um, a good point there, and I wanted to go, so this is from his, this was the text that went with the exhibition. So there's a big book um, published with all the accidents that were shown in the exhibition. And then this smaller book was published, this is a, the cover there is the World Trade Center. Actually blowing up, there's a photo of it. So I want to talk a little bit about the integral accident. Just uh, three things out of this book. And the first is, that in order to avoid shortly inhabiting the planetary dimensions of an integral accident, and then he defines integral accident. He's talking about Chernobyl before that. He says, what an integral accident, and I'll go back to that slide, is an accident. <coughs> that is capable of integrating a whole heap of accidents and disasters through chain reactions. And he says, we have to start right now building, inhabiting, and thinking about the laboratory of cat cat um, catastrophe, the museum of the accident of technological progress. And that's what the show was called. That that really an integral accident is this, this chain reaction of a whole heap of incidents and disasters that happen at the same time. He also says that we live in the time of accidents, that that is our time. He says that, interestingly, from Aristotle on, the accident is what remains unexpected, truly surprising, what he calls the unknown quantity of our planet, of a planetary habitat. That we don't know when the accident's gonna happen. We actually don't know what causes it. That it's truly surprising. And it's sort of, it's the unexpected that occurs in, it's the unknown quantity that occurs in our planetary habitat. And I'll just end with this one. In, in what he wrote on the future of the accident, he says that if inventing the substance means indirectly inventing the accident, then the more powerful and high performance the invention, the more dramatic the accident is going to be. So in that way, you can kind of see how our accidents that occur have gotten more and more extreme because they've gotten more um, the invention has gotten more and more technological and more and more high powered. And I think I will end with that. So we have about eight minutes to go. Why don't you come back by 10 after and we've got four people presenting. And we'll do the seminar.